Welcome to Dave Talks Comics. I'm Dave. This is my podcast where I talk about comic books, cartoons, and comic book conventions. This is episode 166. All past episodes can be streamed or downloaded from the program's website, davetalkscomics.com. In addition to the program's website, this podcast can also be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook. You can find my notes and what I have read at davetalkscomics.net. Usually there's a disclaimer or a spoiler warning in here, but since I'm going to be talking about Heroes Con, there is no spoiler warning. Anyhow, this is part three of my coverage of Heroes Con, and actually before I get into the recording I made on day two... This is part three, but day two of Heroes Con. I have a couple things, a couple notes about stuff that I think I talked about on the last episode. First, I wanted to say that some of this is going to sound familiar because some of the things I said, like right at the end of the previous episode, I had already recorded those thoughts. And so they're they're in this at the very beginning. It only lasts about a minute, but of course, if you want to, you can fast forward. I, I don't have any time stamps in there to tell you exactly where that ends. But like I said, it's only about a minute. Maybe a minute and a half. Second thing, cartoonist K. Fabe. They have not released yet the panel that I went to on the first day of Heroes Con. They have released some video from Heroes Con, though, or Heroes Con related video. Let's put it that way. First off, they have released two interviews that they did at Heroes Con, one with Tim Vigil, another with Warren Bernard. I'm not really familiar with either of those creators. Uh, I think the first one's about two hours. The second one is about an hour and a half, if I remember correctly. These are video interviews. You can also get them through Stitcher, and I will include a link to that in the show notes, because as far as video interviews go, you don't really need to watch them, because basically... It's the interview person is on camera, Rug and Piscor are not. You don't see them, and it's basically just the person who's being interviewed answering questions and talking, and you can hear their questions coming from off camera, but you don't really need to watch it. If you subscribe, if you get it through Stitcher, it'll just be an audio file, and you can listen to it on your your smartphone or whichever device or your computer, or wherever, but like I said, there's nothing really to the video, unlike some of their other shows. Some of their shows, like the one I listened to about For the Man Who Has Everything, where they actually showed images. Now there, you probably do want to watch the video. Those are usually much shorter, like a half hour in, in that range. Oh, and they did do one episode, a Heroes Con debrief episode, where they, and that might have been about 40 or 50 minutes long, where they talked about Heroes Con, talked about what they did. Once again, I, if I remember correctly, it's been about a week since I watched it, they didn't, there's, there's no real video content necessary there. I mean, if you want to see them talking about it, they're both on camera, Jim Rugg and Ed Piscor. But you don't really need to. It is just them talking about about Heroes Con. At least that's what I recall. And the only other thing I want to mention is that I have started to read one of the comic books I bought a couple weeks ago now at Heroes Con was Green Lantern number 127, I believe. And I have st- I've finally started to read that small run of Green Lantern that I have, which is Green Lantern 125 to 128. I have not. I have made some notes about it, but I have not put it up on on DaveTalksComics.net just yet. But hopefully, within the next few weeks, it will be. So, depending on when you're listening to this, maybe it's already there, maybe it isn't. Okay. I don't want this to take forever like it did last night. I actually end up recording three or four times before I ended up with a recording that I liked. I mean, I got like, I think a half hour in to recording twice before I decided that I wasn't satisfied with what I was producing. 
And so I went back and I just turned it off and I looked at my notes and I tried to figure out what I was doing wrong. And at first I thought I was just inhibited because I was in this hotel room. It was late at night and it felt like the people in the next room must be able to hear me. And so I was trying to keep my voice down. Even now I think I'm trying to keep my voice down. But I think I'm a little more comfortable in this room at this point. I'm not crazy about the acoustics in here for recording. I don't think it's going to come out awful. But I don't think I like it quite as much as I do. And I think part of it is the fact that there's no carpeting in this hotel. Well, in the hotel room at least there's no carpeting. Anyhow. Today is Saturday, June 15th, 2019. Today was the second day of Heroes Con. It's about 8 o'clock? No, about 8.35, 8.40 at night. And I'm trying to record <laughs> my summary of what I saw and did today. So, let's see. I, ha- I decided to have breakfast at the hotel. They have a free complimentary breakfast. It was okay. It was not awful. It was nothing too terribly inspiring. I think I might go out for breakfast tomorrow morning to a place that I went to at least a few years ago, possibly as far back as, like, say, 2012 or 2014. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think possibly as far back as 2012. I might be able to check my records and figure that out. But uh, I think I would like to go out for breakfast tomorrow. And the show doesn't open until 11, no wait, 11, yes, 11 tomorrow, open to 10 today. So why not? And this place isn't near the the hotel. It's going to be probably a 20 minute drive, but anyhow. So I had breakfast at the hotel, then I took care of a couple things, then I took off. I drove downtown. I went to uh, I parked in a different garage. I paid, I think, a dollar. I think I could have gotten a, a, a place in a garage that was a block closer. It would cost me a dollar less. But for whatever reason, I decided to park in this garage. It was an above-ground parking garage as opposed to... On Friday, it was a below-ground parking garage. And I don't know. Does that really make a difference? I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, I got to the show. I knew there, there was a panel at 11 that I wanted to go to, I had about, I think, 40 minutes, something like that, by the time I got into the convention center. I decided to go downstairs and look for a couple of the people that I had looked for on Friday, but who were busy talking to other people, and I I managed to find both of them and talk to both of them in this stretch of time before the 11 o'clock panel began. And the first person was Drew Moss, he actually had somebody at his table, but the guy had was picking something up and was ready to move on, and he, he stepped away as soon as soon basically as soon as about the same time that I got there. And I stood there and I talked to Drew for maybe 15 minutes. I wasn't really keeping close track of, of it. I, I congratulated him on the announcement on his new, uh, his new series that he's going to be drawing on Red Sonia and Vampirella team-up book for Dynamite. I'm kind of curious about that. Uh, he he told me a little bit about it. He said it's kind of going to... I think he said it's going to involve time travel and it's kind of a buddy cop type of thing where Vampirella... I mean, they're, they're very different personalities. So it sounds interesting and it sounds like something like that I might enjoy. I probably will not buy the issues as they come out, but I'll wait until they've been out for a little while and pick them up when they're on sale through Comixology or something like that, because that's the sort of guy that I am, sort of cheap SOB that I am. The other thing I asked him about was his werewolf book uh, that he that I, I supported through Kickstarter. I'm, I'm eager to see that. He's saying it's running a little bit behind schedule. He says he thinks it'll be done by August, but he's thinking about pushing back the release date, until, at least for the physical copies, until October, because that way it'll come out around Halloween. And, oh yeah, and somebody walked up 
while we were talking and, you know, kind of interrupted, I didn't mind because I'd been standing there already for maybe 10 minutes, who wanted to show him a commission that uh, Michelle Fife had done of cable for him, which I, I thought was pretty neat. And one of the things they started talking about was this different armor that, that uh, Cable had some crab armor, and that's how Fife drew it for him. And uh, Drew Moss was like, no, no way, I wouldn't want to have to draw that. And, and then they started talking about another story, I think it was from X-Force. In fact, I looked it up, I know it's from X-Force now. But they were talking about a story where Mike Mignola drew an ish, issue of X-Force, drew in uh, a flashback story from Cable's life, which... I have not seen this story, but it sounded kind of neat, and it's the one and only time, I think, that Mike Mignola drew X-Force. In fact, I'm pretty sure it is the only time that Mike Mignola drew X-Force. So I kind of want to find this issue. It may not be dirt cheap, but it's definitely going on my list of things to look for. And I believe it is X-Force number 8, and that's the 1991 series of X-Force. And I believe it's Rob Liefeld was drawing the series, writing probably writing also, and drawing the series at that point. And so he kind of draws the first and last page, and then the bulk of the issue is drawn by Mike Mignola. So I'm just curious to see what that would be like. I'm not a big fan of Mike Mignola, but I do like... I'm sorry, I'm not a big fan of Rob Liefeld, but I do like Mike Mignola's artwork, even when it sometimes is a little incomprehensible as was the case with that Hellboy story I read recently. What was it? The I talked about it a few episodes back on on this podcast. I read it a, a few months ago. After I talked to Drew Moss, I walked a few aisles over and I found Chris Schweitzer's table. I he he didn't have anybody there, so I no, that's not true. Once again, he did have somebody there. It was Craig Fisher was standing there talking to him. But I I hung out for five or ten minutes while Craig wrapped up his conversation with uh, with Chris. And then I talked to Chris for a little while, and I've talked to him a few times before. I'm not sure if he knows my name, but uh, he, he said hi, and I think he recognizes my face. And we, t- we talked about a few things. I mentioned the fact that I've been reading his sketchbook that came out, I think, in 2011, which I bought from him two years ago at Heroes Con. He did this nice sketch of one of the characters from Krogan's Loyalty in there. Uh, I'm probably two-thirds of the way through it. There's still a, a meaty section in there, which has to do with his, his plans for the Krogan's books and possibly some of his work on some of the earlier Krogan's books, because there's definitely some planning in there for some of the books that he has yet to do. And I don't know, I'm starting to wonder if or when he'll get back. I hope someday he gets back to those, but it seems like he's at least knee-deep into other things that are proving to be fairly successful or that he's enjoying doing. And so who knows when he's going to get back and do... Uh, another book, another Krogan's, another book in the Krogan series. I did ask him about his movie posters because as I was looking at them, I had a, th- not today, but over the past week or two, when I was looking through the sketchbook, I was thinking, you know, with all the work he's done on these movie posters, why hasn't he done, has he done a movie poster of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea? And the answer is no, he hasn't. And I got him to confirm that. And I, I asked him, you know, that's something you should really... I, I think that that seems like right up your alley, something that you would enjoy doing. He kind of agreed with me, but at the same time, he also pointed out that Francesco Francavilla did a movie poster for 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And these are not official movie posters. I mean, these are posters which are basically done like official movie posters, but these are things that might be done for a revival showing, like a, a, a second run or whatever. Uh, what do they call them? Repertory theaters, I think they call them, where they show old movies. Chris has done a number of posters for these, these sorts of things, for all sorts of well-known movies, some recent, some not so recent. 
And, I mean, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is over 50 years old at this point. It may be over, it's, I think it came out in the 50s or something like that. I mean, I saw it when I was a kid in the late 70s, so it was already at least 20 years old, I'm thinking, at that point. I don't know how much demand there would be for something like that, but it's just the the look of the Nautilus, the submarine in that movie, and the squids. If, you, if you've seen his sketchbook, if you've seen some of the work he's done, that Chris has done, Chris Schweitzer has done, it just seems like a natural for something for him to draw. He did show me an image of the Francesco's, Francesco Francovia's poster for 20,000, and it's good. It does not look like something right out of the movie. Maybe it does. You know, it's been a long time since I saw that film. But he said he would think about it. He said he would, you know, uh, I didn't get the impression it was something that was on the list before, but he, he said it was, it was something that he would, he would think about. Uh, I did buy, he, he had done these cards of Santa Claus and of various incarnations of Santa Claus, like Father Christmas and uh, St. Nicholas, and there's ten of them in all, and he he did each one, they're printed on cards, and they have uh, descriptions below them about the characters. I didn't buy them for myself, I bought them for my mother, because I think she'll really like them, and it was just ten dollars for all ten cards. I mean, he was selling them as a set, you couldn't just buy one, but I thought it was a, a, a great deal, and I think my mother will really like them. She likes Christmas decorations, and actually the way he had them set up was really neat because he had them kind of, the figures kind of cut out so that they were standing up. And I asked him about that, and he said, well, that's something that I did, so you could cut them out, but it would to do them anywhere near as nice as he did them would really be some work. And actually, you know what, now that I think about it, I should have taken a picture of that, and I might go back tomorrow and take a picture of his display of his uh, of his Santa Claus cards t- so I can show her that when I give her this present. And I'm not sure when. It, it might be a Christmas present for her. So she may not see it for another six months. The first panel that I went to today was the Black Thumb Society panel. And this was a inkers panel. Mark Evanier was the was the moderator, and the three anchors on the panel were Klaus Janssen, John Beatty, and Mike Royer. And this was one that I definitely highlighted. It's one that I wanted to go to. Mark does a pretty good job of running a panel. He certainly did an excellent job in this case in running this panel, I think. He, he asked questions of the, of the three anchors, and he got... They interacted a bit with one another as well as interacting one on one with Mark. He asked questions like, you know, what do you think your job is as an inker? How did you get into inking? Did you plan to be an inker? Because I think a lot of people who do get into inking come in as artists and then at some point somebody starts directing them towards inking. Or at least that's the impression I got from this conversation and that I got from other conversations that I've heard along similar lines, whether it's on a podcast or a panel that I've seen at a show like Heroes Con. He also asked questions like, did you ever turn down a job or try to turn down a job because you didn't feel like it was right for you? Or to put it another way, you weren't the right person for that job? or maybe the right person, maybe because of the content, or probably more importantly because of the artist, that you weren't a good match for that artist. Uh, Klaus Jansen talked a little bit about his, uh, his inking work. Uh, when he told stories about how he got into inking, he mentioned he had shown, before he, he got his first professional job, he'd shown his, his portfolio to Gil Kane, and Gil Kane thought he was three years away from being a good uh, penciler, but only a year away from being a good inker. And so he was kind of desperate to get into the industry at that point. And so he decided to, to go to take the inking route, I guess. And I think most of his work is as an inker, 
but he has, I believe, done some penciling work. And I know him best from his work inking the work of of Frank Miller on on Daredevil in Miller's first run on the book. They got into a little discussion about breakdowns and what breakdowns are as opposed to, I guess, full pencils. I don't, I don't remember if they used the term full pencils, but I think that would be the other term. They talked about there was something called a more pattern that came up that had to do with zipatone and how zipatone and how to apply zipatone. And I know zipatone is something that they use in the inking process, but it's something... I'm not sure exactly what it is. You'd probably be better off going and checking for it, uh, doing a Google search for what Zipatone is. I know I've seen it in books. I think John Byrne used it when he did, at least in some issues, of Namor the Submariner. I believe he, because I think he mentioned it in, in the letters column. They, they they talked a little bit about inkers who influenced them, people like Dick uh, Giordano, that was somebody who Klaus Jansen mentioned. I believe Murphy Anderson's name came up. Al Williamson, Frank Frazetta. John Beatty said something to Klaus Jansen about how his work reminded him of Hank Ketchum, who, I believe he said Hank Ketchum, who is the guy who created Dennis the Menace that there was something about the way he, he inks, the way his lines, I think, go from from thin to thick, that reminded him of Ketchum's work. And I've kind of got a vague idea of what Ketchum's work looks like, but I don't... I would really have to compare the two to see what he's talking about. But I'm sure John Beatty, as an inker, who's been in the industry for over 30 years, or something like 30 years... Has, has a much better idea than I do of whether that's a valid comparison or not. Klaus Jansen talked about regretting turning down an op- one opportunity that he regrets was turning... He Tim Sale had asked him to ink Dark Victory, which I believe was the second collaboration that Tim Sale and... Oh, I'm blanking on the writer's names. Sale and Jeff Loeb. Yes, I believe Loeb and Sale, who have done a number of books together, but I believe that was their second Batman collaboration, or at least big Batman collaboration, the first one being The Long Halloween, which I have read. I have not read Dark Victory, though. I have not been the biggest fan of Tim Sale and Jeff Loeb's um, collaborations. I don't know. None of them have really struck me as... Great. I think I like Sale's artwork more than I like Loeb's stories or the, the, the overall plots of the stories. I don't know. It, it feels sometimes like there's something lacking there. I've read Long Halloween. I've read Catwoman When in Rome. I have read... Oh, they, they did one for the, the Challengers of the Unknown... I don't know, that might be it. There may not be anything else of theirs. I've read, I've also read that Tim Sale issue of Solo, but I don't know if Jeff Loeb wrote any of that. I I don't recall if he did, but there was a number of short stories in there. And that's a very good issue of Solo. And if you can get your hands on it or your hands on, I think there's a collection that was printed at some point, but it might be out of print at this point. Somebody, and I think it was Mark Evanier, talked about Mike Sikowski, who was a penciler, and how he thought he was miscast quite often, and that his his best work probably would have been doing a Charles Adams-style cartoon. And Charles Adams was, is, of course, the person who did the Adams Family cartoons, who originated the Adams Family, which was appeared in The New Yorker, and then was a TV show, and of course they did two movies in the 1990s. And I think there's even been cartoons of it, you know, animated cartoons of it, though I don't think I've ever seen those. And they they took a few questions from the audience asking if there was ever a collaboration that they, they were very pleased with, or... That they 
that, that they were very pleased with or one that they thought that should have worked but didn't work. And I don't know if they ever really gave an answer on that question. I don't think they did. And there was one little moment for me in the middle of all this. It was not a proud moment for me. <laughs> Mark Evanier started to ask a question, and I thought he was asking the audience for input. And he was actually speaking because he was looking out at the audience. He wasn't looking at any of the panelists. And he seemed to be fumbling for some. And I thought, I, in retrospect, I think he was fumbling for how to word the question. And I thought he was asking the audience for the name of an, another anchor. And I wasn't entirely sure what. And then I thought I heard somebody behind me say something, but I couldn't hear exactly what they said. And so I shouted out the name Jerry Ordway. And Mark Evanier looked at me a little strange. And he said, yes, he's an inker, and, he, and I believe he's at the show, and I think he's got a panel later on. And then he just went on, <laughs> which made it clear to me that I had completely screwed up and that he wasn't asking for input from the audience. And I think my face probably turned red. And I was kind of embarrassed. I actually thought about getting up and leaving the room, but I figured that would probably be an even bigger distraction. So, and we were only maybe halfway through this panel. So I stayed there. I stayed put. And uh, I, I probably looked like an idiot. <laughs> I'm sure I looked like an idiot. But when they came time, when they did have time for questions later on, I did not ask any questions. I did tape this panel so you can hear my little flub as well as the rest of the conversation, and they were all very well mic'd. I think it should come out very clear. I have not gone back and checked it to see what the sound quality of this panel is like. The second panel that I went to today was the sketch-off with Garcia Lopez, with Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, Lee Weeks, and Paul Pelletier, all of whom's work I like all of whom I'm pretty sure I've read comic books that they've done. Two of them I can name off the top of my head. I know Paul Pelletier. I've read a number of things that he's done. He first came to my attention when he was doing Negation for CrossGen, and I've also read a number of stuff that he's done for Marvel, like I think he did a few issues of Wolverine, he did a few issues of She-Hulk, and he did some other things. Like I think he did a short run on Fantastic Four. I believe he's now doing Hulk. I'm very impressed by the work he's done, and I find it very, and at some point during the panel, uh, they ask questions, and well, they ask questions throughout the panel, because basically the way the panel worked was that they gave the artist a character, they asked for suggestions from the audience, then they gave the artist a character, and the artist worked on characters, and then the audience asked questions of them, and there was a moderator there, the audience asked questions of them while the artist drew. So getting back to these artists, okay, so Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, I know very recently I read Twilight, which he did with Howard Chaikin. Chaikin wrote it, and, and Garcia Lopez drew it. And this was, this was like a mini-series. I talked about it on the podcast. I wasn't crazy about the story itself or the way it wound down, but I really liked Jose's work, his, the, the way he drew it, and the visual storytelling. Lee Weeks, I, I want to say he drew that Gambit miniseries, which I read a number of years ago, possibly before I started doing the podcast. I mean, it came out in the 1990s, I think. Yeah, I believe it came out in the 1990s. So basically, the first character that they that they were given was Dead Man. And so they each worked on Dead Man for, I guess, about 20 minutes or so. And then they showed us what they had drawn. And they had handed out numbers, and they had a raffle at the end. So they drew numbers, and whoever's number they drew got the corresponding uh, sketch or commission, or I guess sketch would be the right way to put it. So they asked them a number of questions while they were drawing, like on their who their influence was, ugh, who their their artistic influences were, who the people who they looked up to, who who were some of their favorite characters, uh, what what do they find difficult to draw, 
what do they uh, do when they have trouble drawing or they have trouble plotting a page? What are some of the tweaks they've done to characters? What are some of the redesigns they've done to characters? What are some of their favorite pages, their favorite writers, their favorite projects? Some of the crazy directions that they've gotten from writers on drawing. And uh, one of those stories, uh, more than one of them talked about how the writer would give them, you know, would write like two sentences and it would be like uh, 500 horsemen come, a, come over a hilltop. And, of course, it takes the writer just a minute or less to write that sentence, but it it takes considerably more time for the artist to draw it. One of the things that came up during this panel was um, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez mentioned uh, Jonah Hex is one of the things. I think he mentioned this as something that he wasn't sure he would like drawing or something that he really enjoyed drawing. And so I actually went back and I looked to see when what he had drawn, because and I actually thought it was something recent, but it wasn't. It was something from the 1970s. He wasn't the first artist to draw Jonah Hex. I believe that was Tony DeZuniga. But he did draw a few appearances of Jonah Hex when he was a the featured character, I guess, in Weird Western Tales in issues 32, 33, and 35. And then he also drew the first five issues of Jonah Hex's comic book series that started in 1977, as well as issues 10, 32, and 73, according to my research. They they showed us the the sketches that they'd drawn for Dead Man. I wasn't crazy about any of them, and so I was kind of hoping I wouldn't win those. Now, the second second character they were given to draw was Wonder Woman, and those were the Two of the three I thought were spectacular. Jose Luis Garcia Lopez's was amazing, looked fantastic. The and Paul Pelletier's I really liked. It did not look just like the Wonder Woman that I what I think of as Wonder Woman, but it was really really nice. Lee Weeks is Wonder Woman. I'm trying to even remember what. It, yeah, it looked a little rough around the edges. It didn't. It looked like he wasn't fully certain what he was. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not. I'm probably not being fair to him. But I, I know that I didn't like it as much as I liked the other two. And then right towards the end of the panel, they were almost out of time. They had them draw the Hulk. And they only had like five minutes to draw the Hulk. And I thought two of them were spectacular. And one of them was just kind of okay. And in this case, Paul Pelletier's was really nice. And Lee Weeks's was really nice, and they were they were very different, but I thought they were both very good. And then uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez version of the Hulk, I was not as crazy about. Uh, I, I don't think he has as much experience drawing that character. In fact, at the beginning of the panel, they asked us to only name uh, DC characters, which was kind of funny because I guess Jose Luis Garcia Lopez has spent most of his career at DC. But Paul Pelletier is now exclusively doing Marvel work. And Lee Weeks, I think, for the most part, has worked for Marvel. Anyhow, so that was basically it for, the, for, that, for that panel. I wasn't, I, you know, I tried taping it. I, I don't think it's going to be much to listen to. It was very hard to hear what Jose Luis Garcia Lopez was saying. Paul Pelletier and Lee Weeks was... It was Definitely easier to understand. They all had mics in front of them, but they did not all sit close enough to the mics. And especially Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, I think he was much more focused on the drawing and wasn't... I think he had a hard time doing both at the same time. I think it was very difficult for him to do both. And it really took him out of his drawing uh, because he really needed the questions repeated. and So... Anyway, that was, the, that was the second panel that I went to today. By the time I got out of that, it was about 1.30. I was thinking about going to lunch at that point, but before I went to lunch, I decided to go back down to the show floor. I had commissioned a piece by Josh Greathouse a couple months ago. He had a Kickstarter for, a, I think, a sketchbook that he did, and I had decided to support him at a level where I would get a painting which was a few hundred dollars. Well, the Kickstarter did not get funded, 
but he still contacted he still contacted everybody to see if they wanted a uh, if they wanted something from him a, a commission and i decided to stick with the level of commission that i originally committed to uh which was a painting a i think it's 11 by 14 or something like that painting or maybe it's 11 by 17 and what i asked him to do was actually what I asked him to do was just Gomez and Morticia Adams. But what he did, from the Adams family, of course, but what he did was basically the whole Adams family. I think the only one who's not in the picture is Cousin Yep. It's the only one. But there's Gomez, there's Morticia, there's Lurch, there's Grandma, there's Pugsley, there's Wednesday, and there's Thing. Yes, they're all in it. And he did a spent he did a fantastic job with it. It is uh the colors on it are beautiful, the way he drew the characters is beautiful. I have posted it on Twitter. I, I need to post it to the, to Facebook. Probably by the time this gets released, I'll post that to Facebook as well, the Facebook group. But I was very happy with it. And then I stood there and I talked to him for maybe another ten or fifteen minutes about anime, uh cowboy bebop. Uh, just talking about his work, he had this beautiful, I don't know if it was a painting or if it was done with markers that he'd done of of Robin Williams. And I believe he, he said it was copied from a, a photograph of Robin Williams. But I really thought it was beautiful. And uh, he, he really did a nice job with it. I, I suppose part of it is due to the photograph because the lighting presumably came directly from the photograph. In other words, he was just copying what was in the photograph. But still, he did a very nice job with the colors. And it looked vaguely familiar. I mean, it certainly looks like Robin Williams. I wasn't sure if uh, who, where it was from, if it was from a movie, or maybe it was something like from a, an interview from a magazine, or something like that. I should probably just do a Google image search for that. I can probably find that out. Um, and somebody else came up who had a book who was who was doing a a, a book that was uh, a sketchbook that he wanted uh, Great House to to draw in. Uh, actually, Great House already had it, and he was working in it. And he had a, a Studio Ghibli focused book, and so we talked about anime for a little bit. The Grave of the Fireflies came up when we were talking about that uh, because somebody had done a, a a sketch in his book for Grave of the Fireflies, which is a movie that I have seen. And it's a very tough movie to watch if you have not seen it. Uh, look it up if, you, if, you, if you're at all interested. I mean, it's a beautifully made movie, but it's a heartbreaking film. Heartbreaking. Anyhow, eventually I moved on. I think it was during this period, before I went to lunch, I, I also went and I found Mark Thomas. And he's the artist who I mentioned in uh, when I was talking about the first day of Heroes Con. He's the one who drew that book about Philly as somebody or other knows that we are not alone, the full title. But he's also done a comic book on Beowulf. So this is the, the, the Phileas book is something that's much more kid, all ages. The, the Beowulf book is something that's much bloodier. So I talked, I stopped and I talked to him for maybe five or ten minutes about his stuff. And I listened to him talk to other people about his stuff. And so I, I asked him about that and I took a card and maybe I'll go back tomorrow and buy it. But I, d I did not um, buy anything from him at that point. He had some prints that were very inexpensive that looked kind of nice. They were just $2 a piece, or you could get one if you bought one of the the Beowulf books or any of the books. I mean, he also had the, the, the Phileas book there. And I, I feel awful just calling it the Phileas book, but maybe at some point I'll look it up and figure out what that is. So then I left the convention center. I dropped my stuff in my car and I went to a place to eat. I think it was called Rhino Market, the Rhino Market. And I had a sandwich, a turkey sandwich, which was very filling. I have not been to dinner yet tonight. And it is probably after 9 o'clock. It is quarter after 9 o'clock at this point, or just about. I, I have not been to dinner yet because I was not hungry when I left the convention center. Otherwise, I might have stopped somewhere on the way, on the way back. So I had a, I think I mentioned a turkey sandwich. I also had a beer which was very good. It was a lager. I asked for a dark beer, and they recommended this dark lager. And, and so I got a taste of that. It had a coffee flavor to it. It was very good. So I had that, and that was all I had, but it was a big sandwich. 
So after I had the sandwich, I went back up to my car, grabbed my bags, went back to the convention center. I, I wonder if it was at that point that I went down to the show floor and talked to Mark Thomas. It might have been then. Yeah, you know what? I think that was when I talked. It was after I'd had lunch. But at one th- no, at 3.30, there was a panel that I wanted to go to, and that was the Celebrating the Legion of Superheroes panel. Now, I taped this one. I'm not sure how good it's going to, the recording is going to come out because two of the people on the panel, Keith Giffen and Joe Staten, did not sit close enough <laughs> to the microphones. It was, I was sitting in the second row, and it was hard to hear them quite often. I got the impression Keith Giffen did not really want to be there, and I say that in part because he, it sounded like his time working on the Legion of Superheroes was not a fun time. Joe Staten kind of said the same thing, too. Even Greg LaRoque, who was the other person on the panel, said that. And I didn't think about it before the panel, but all three of these guys are artists. I mean, Keith Giffen, I think, was credited as a co-writer in some ins- And he did write some of uh, the Legion. But, but they didn't have somebody who was purely a writer, like Paul Levitz, or I think they mentioned Jerry Conway was somebody who'd written, and I, Abnett and Lanning, I believe, wrote some. Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning, I think that's it, wrote some of uh, the Legion of Superheroes. My experience with the Legion is mostly with when Paul Levitz was writing it and Keith Giffen was drawing it. And I may have read a few issues earlier than that. I'm, so there was a lot of talk about how they didn't enjoy working on the Legion, which was a little disappointing because the title of the panel was Celebrating the Legion of Superheroes. And the person who moderated it, Nancy Northcott, is obviously somebody who's a big Legion fan. She was wearing a Legion t-shirt that she's had for 30 years. She says she only wears it for Heroes Con. But somebody asked her where she got it, and she said she got it at Heroes Aren't Hard to Find 30 years ago. But they talked about things like just burning out on doing the Legion, and they said it was partly... I mean, there was a few things that came up in that respect. I mean, Keith Giffen talked about it like it was a prison sentence. You know, nobody wanted to work on the Legion, and finding out you were going to be working on... And nobody asked to work on the Legion. I mean, that's the impression they gave you. At least artists did not ask to work on the Legion. I mean, and there was two things they talked about that... in Well, at least two, maybe three things they talked about that they didn't like about the series. Uh, one was the fact that, you know, basically they were told there's no reference material. You know, you just have to make everything up. You know, so it wasn't like they could look things up because these are all futuristic things, they're all sci fi things. The other thing is the large cast. I mean, the, the team has a huge cast of people. If you, you know, I mean, the, the team has, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 members. I'm not sure how many there are. They don't all appear in every issue, but it can, I guess it can wear you down if you're constantly having to draw somebody new and they're constantly introducing new characters. Keith Giffen talked about how much he disliked Karate Kid, how he killed him three times in his uh, in his time writing this series over the various incarnations that he worked on. Uh, they, they were asked about their favorite characters. I think Joe Staten, I think, talked about mon and Saturn Girl and Lightning Lad. Keith Giffen mentioned Cosmic Boy being one of his favorite characters. I don't remember, I didn't write down who Greg LaRoque said was his favorite character. He did talk about, they also, when they talked about who... The punching bag characters like Karate Kid in the case of Keith Giffen, uh, Greg LaRoque did mention Brainiac 5 always seemed to be the punching bag. And the other thing that they talked about, I said that there was three things before. The other thing they talked about that they thought, and Keith Giffen in particular mentioned this, that they had a problem with the series was that they felt like it has never evolved. That it was originally conceived of as a clubhouse, a bunch of characters who were, you know, a, a bunch of friends who were hanging out together, uh, men and women in this cosmic clubhouse a thousand years in the future, and that the concept really hasn't evolved since then. There have been attempts to change it, but it always seems to come back to this original concept. 
it just is not kept up with the times and that it, it really needs to evolve. And, and, and they, you know, and so, and so that's a real problem. It's, it's like something, a throwback to the 1960s, to the Silver Age. I think they also talk, uh, Keith Giffen also said something about uh, how much he had to fight DC editorial when he was writing the, was it the Five Years Later Legion? Is that what it was? Something like that. Uh, but, but that it was, it was a constant fight over things. I mean, one of the things he mentioned was how they, after Crisis on Infinite Earths, they wrote out the fact, because the way the Legion was originally conceived, the Legion of Superheroes was created because these three heroes came together who idolized Superboy. And those were Saturn Girl, Lightning Lad, and Cosmic Boy. And they were the, the original three members of the team. When, when After Crisis on Infinite Earths, there was no Superboy for a time there. And so they basically had to write Superboy out of the origin of the Legion of Superheroes. But then if, if there's no Superboy, is there no Legion? And Keith seemed to both put down the idea of Superboy being th- their, their, their idol or their, their inspiration. And at the same time, he also seemed put off by the fact that he was forced to change things in that particular regard. So it was not a it was not a great panel. <laughs> it was an experience. It was an interesting experience. I kind of wish Paul Levitz had been there. I kind of wish they had writers. I I'd be willing to go to another Legion panel provided uh, Keith Giffen wasn't there. I think this is the first time I've seen Keith Giffen on a panel. And one of the reasons why I did go is because Keith Giffen was on the panel. I didn't expect to be, there to be quite that much snark, and it would have been nice if he had sat closer to the microphone. <laughs> I almost, I, I felt tempted to raise my hand and ask, you know, do you need a support group for former artists on the Legion of Superheroes? I mean, it was that bad. And if the recording came out at all, then I will post it, but we'll see. The final panel that I went to today was the, and, and it was the last panel of the day, I believe, as well, because the, the, the show closed about the time this panel ended, so I did not have a chance to go back down to the show floor. And that was the, the Kirby panel. Let's see, what is it called? All Hail Jack Kirby. That's the name of the panel. And this was Mark Evanier, Mike Royer, Jim Amish? I think it's Amish. And Rand Hoppy. I think it's Hoppy. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's H-O-P-P-E. And I have seen him on a panel before a couple years ago at the Kirby at 100 panel at Baltimore, which was also moderated by Mark Evanier, but was a much bigger panel. It had a lot more people. I think that was the one. Oh, no, that was the... Yeah, I think it was. Because they had... Oh, there was all those tribute panels that year. Was that the year that... Um, after Len Wein passed, or was that last year's Baltimore? Ugh, I don't remember now. But I think there was a lot of people on that panel. Because I think, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Anyhow, moving along. Mark Evanier dominated this panel. Uh, it was the end of the day. He seemed tired. Conversation sometimes got kind of off of the subject of Kirby. At, at least one or two times it did, and seemed... He seemed to be more talking, Mark Evanier seemed to be talking about himself more than he was about Kirby. It didn't last too, too long, but I mean, for maybe five minutes he was going on. Uh, and I think it, it grew out of something organic to the conversation, but it just, it was a tangent. It was going off in a direction that had nothing to do with Jack Kirby, or at least that's the way it felt. So he opened it by talking to Mike Royer, who was also on the inking panel, and who had been Jack Kirby's inker from, I think he had started doing work with Kirby in the late 60s, and then he officially became Kirby's regular inker in 72. And I'm not sure how long he his collaboration with Kirby went for, I think until like the late 70s or maybe the early 80s. I think at some point he went to work for, uh, Mike Royer went to work for Disney, and at that point uh, Kirby had to find somebody else to help him, and I don't remember. Maybe that was when he got Greg Theakston to work with him, to to ink his work. I don't remember. Anyway, they talked about 
how, and this was actually something, there was a little bit of overlap between the inking panel and this panel. They talked about how he got to work, about what it was like working for Kirby early on, meeting Kirby's wife, becoming kind of a member of the family, and why Kirby wanted him, why Kirby wanted an inker. Wanted, and, and, and the story is that Kirby wanted somebody that he could count on because he felt like he was, he was living on the West Coast in California at that point, and he would send his pages, penciled but not inked, back to New York to, I think it was Marvel originally and then later D.C., and somebody back there would ink them, and they were doing things to them that he did not like, like redrawing faces, and I think that's something that happened even after... I don't know the full story on that. I do know that like Superman's face and Jimmy Olsen's face quite often would be redrawn when Kirby was writing and drawing when Kirby was writing and drawing Jimmy Olsen, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen. Then he uh Jim Amish talked about uh meeting Kirby. Jim Amish is from North Carolina and he talked about uh cold calling Jack Kirby along with a bunch of other people. And in the case of Kirby, he was wishing him a happy birthday and how that eventually led to Kirby visiting North Carolina. And it wasn't entirely clear if that was for a Heroes Con or not, but I kind of got the impression it might be, or at least it was for some convention in North Carolina. And this would have been in the 1970s. I believe that's what he said. But I, once again, I, if he mentioned a year, a specific year, I, don't, I didn't write it down and I don't recall so I took a lot of notes on this panel. Well, not a ton, but enough notes on this panel. Kirby talked about um, how he was sure he was creating. Mark talked about because the, the issue of Kirby getting properly compensated came up. And Mark mentioned that Kirby felt that eventually the comics he was creating would be making, made into movies that would, that would you know, generate millions of dollars, and of course nowadays it's billions of dollars. And eventually he was correct, but of course he did not live to see that day. Rand Hoppy showed some oversized printed pages of Kirby art where they have the the pencils, in some cases they have the pencils, then they have the penciled inked pages, and then they have the colored pages on these huge pages. So I'm going to have to check that out. At the, I mean, they were gorgeous. The, the, the pages that he brought were from... I think it was from New Gods. Was it from New Gods or was it from Thor? It might have been from Thor. I'm not sure now that I think about it. It was something that I had not read. Yeah, I'm not sure which which one it was, but it it looked beautiful. And I don't know if this is just something they have on display or this is something they have for sale. And if they do have it for sale, i got to imagine it's going to be expensive because it is just unbelievably beautiful. There was a question about some of Kirby's romance works that he did, romance comic book work he did in the 1970s. And apparently Two Morrows is getting ready to print a collection of them. I think it's coming out next year, something like that. I'm not certain. But somebody asked about that. Uh, let's see, what was it? Dingbats, True Divorce Cases and Soul Romances, and I believe that's S-O-U-L, Romances. And I have no idea how big this is going to be or the full details. I don't think anything's been announced through Tomorrow's. Um, it's possible there's been an announcement, but I don't think they've actually solicited this at this point. There was a question about where Kirby got his ideas, and Mark Evanier talked a little bit about, you know, how he was reading all kinds of things, because if you, especially when you get into the 1970s, even in his stuff in the 1960s, when he was working at Marvel, his stuff for Fantastic Four, for Thor, then later his work on The Fourth World and Eternals, Commandy, all these things. There's some really bizarre stuff in there. And Mark Evanier swears that all he had to do was mention the littlest thing, and Kirby would come up with all sorts of ideas. And he said he didn't think all of those ideas were great, but the fact that Kirby was just able to spitball from the smallest mention of something just was amazing. He said something about the the um, the Stone Men of Eastern Ireland from, and I think I might have heard this story before from Journey into Mystery. I 
I think it was number 83. Wasn't that the first issue that Thor showed up in? I'm not sure. I may have to correct that. But he was very impressed. I mean, Mark Evanier was very impressed. And like I said, Mark did a lot of talking during this panel. In fact, Mark and Mike Royer did, I'd say, most of the talking. Rand Hoppy and Jim Amish did not speak very much. I mean, they, they, they talked a little bit, but considerably less than either of the others. And 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 Mark Evanier talked considerably more than, than uh, Mike Royer did. Somebody asked him how close Mark Evanier was to finishing up his Jack Kirby biography. He, they, there was a question about whether Kirby got upset when DC Comics redrew the faces he did. Was he disappointed over the cancellation of the Fourth World comic books? And there was finally a question about what Kirby comics do you like to read when you're feeling down? You know, what Kirby comics pick you up? Uh, and I think that was basically it for this panel. Not my favorite uh, Kirby panel. I think I would like to see a Kirby panel at this point without Mark Evanier. I've seen him on a number of panels. I like him. I think he's better when he's talking one-on-one with somebody. I think possibly my favorite panel with him was the panel he did with with Marv Wolfman. It was either I think it was last year at Baltimore Comic Con. I mean, that was a really good conversation between the two of them. I think that was, it was either last year or 2017. I'm not sure which it was. So anyway, at that point, the, basically the show was closed for the day. That was the last panel of the day. I know that there's an auction that I think is, has started and is ongoing right now at the, at the convention hotel, which is not where I am and not where I'm staying. But I came back to my hotel. I took care of a couple of things, made a few more notes, and, and then I started recording I, I as I said, I tweeted out that uh, that oh I did forget something before I before I went into the Kirby panel I ran into Mike Myers and Bill Bomer from uh, Geek Brunch podcast and I talked to Mike uh, both before we went into the panel and then a little bit after I was sitting outside the room because there was about fifteen twenty minutes between the time that the the Legion panel ended, and the um, the Legion panel and the Kirby panel began. And Mike was standing around out there, and I kind of noticed him. He was talking to somebody else, and then he came over and he talked to me. He said hi, and he had not gotten. He likes to take pictures with other people that he knows, and so he took a picture with me, and he posted that, and I retweeted it. So it's also in my feed. If you go to uh, at Dave Talks Comics on Twitter. You should see it there. It shouldn't be too far back because I don't tweet very much. Uh, so I retweeted that. I tweeted the picture of the Adams Family painting that Josh Greathouse did. But we talked a little bit about stuff. I showed him the painting. I showed him some of the comic books that I mentioned that I bought yesterday. I did not buy any more comic books today. And hopefully I'll run into him again tomorrow. There aren't very many panels tomorrow. I, I did recommend that they go to the cart- one of the cartoonist kayfabe panels. And I did tell them, I, I, I filled them in on the fact that those will be videos that you can watch online. But, And he asked me to let him know when I post this, this, this episode of Dave Talks Comics because he wants to hear what I had to say about the, the, the Legion panel. I, I gave him a preview, and I, I don't know how much he's going to... I need to do that. Anyhow, that's basically it for day two of Heroes Con. So far, I've been having quite a bit of fun. I thought that the show floor was basically a little more empty. It wasn't quite as full today as I remember it being sometimes on Saturdays. But, I don't know, you know, I did go to four panels today, so how much time did I really spend on the show floor? Maybe I really didn't get a true feel. It definitely looked more full than it was on Friday. But it still, it wasn't packed. It wasn't impossible to get around. Anyhow, okay, I think I need to cut this off. I uh, possibly need to look into going, getting something to eat because I have not eaten dinner yet. So basically that's it for day two. Okay, so that's it more or less for episode 166 of Dave Talks Comics. But before I go, I have some notes, some follow-up on some things I said in that recording I made in the evening of day two of Heroes Con. So first... X-Force number 8, 
the issue that is for the most part drawn by Mike Mignola. That is available on Marvel Unlimited. I have started to read it. I probably should have finished it by now. But I've started to read it. It's not a very deep read. It's basically Cable and the Wild Pack, is it? You see, I really don't know this series. On a mission, and they run into invading a Hydra complex for something, for trying to obtain something for somebody else. Yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. I know who the somebody else is. But there will be notes once I've finished reading it. I don't think I'm going to go back and read any other issues of X-Force, but I just kind of wanted to see what that issue was like. And, yeah. (laughs) Next, uh, also on a Mike Mignola note, Hellboy Seed of Destruction, I mentioned it in this episode. That's the four-part miniseries. That's the first four-part Hellboy comic book, even though it's not his first appearance. I believe he first appeared in an issue of John Byrne's Next Men. I talked about this miniseries, this Hellboy miniseries, on episode 162 of the podcast. There will be a link in the show notes. During the cart, not the cartoonist, the Inkers panel, the Black Thumb Society, I believe it was called, I, me- I said something about John Beatty having been in the comics comic book industry for 30 years. I was wrong. It's about 40 years since about 1980. 79, 80, somewhere around there. The Solo Collected Edition. Yes, I was correct. It is out of print, but you can find it on Amazon for about $700 right now as I record this. Single issues can be found for much more reasonable prices online, whether it's eBay or Comic Collector Live or MyComicShop.com or I'm sure there's other websites that have them. You might have to pay 3 or 4 or $5 an episode. I'm sure you can pay more than that if you really want to. You might be able to find them for less than that if they're not in the best of shape. I have four issues. I think there's only two more that I really want to have. Let's see, I have the the Tim Sale issue, which I believe was the first one, the Jordy Bernay issue, the Darwin Cook issue, and the Sergio Aragonis issue. And the other two that I want that I don't have are the Howard Chaikin and the, the Mike Allred issues. Yes, those are the other ones that I really want to have. Now, it, the, the collected edition is available on Comixology, It retails right now for about $35, but they have sales from time to time, like a couple times a year they'll have sales, and a lot of those trades that usually retail in that range you can get for like $5 or $6. So if you're really interested, get it now. If you feel like you can wait, wait, or just try and find the single issues, or just ignore this altogether if you have no interest in that series. Twilight. Uh, the 1990 miniseries by Howard Chaikin and Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. I talked about that also on episode 162 of the podcast. Once again, there will be a link in the show notes. Gambit, the 1993 miniseries, four-issue miniseries by Howard Mackey, Lee Weeks, and Klaus Janssen. I talked about that on episode 48 of the podcast. Check the show notes for the link. And the last couple things are related to Mark Evanier. The Mark Evanier, Mar- Marv, Mark and Marv, Mark Evanier and Marv Wolfman panel happened at the 2017 Baltimore Comic Con. And I did record it. It is available on my website. I did put it up there. And I will provide a link in the show notes. The Len Wein tribute panel was that same year, 2017. I. I believe I recorded it, but I did not put it up because the audio just did not come out very good. And Maybe there's somebody else who recorded it who got a better recording. It was a very big panel, and it was a lot of fun. Well, maybe fun isn't the right... Well, I don't know. Fun kind of is the right word. They really were celebrating Len Wein. It's a tragedy that he passed as young as he did, but it was great to see so many people have so many great things to say about him. And if you're interested in more on that, you can listen to my comments. I, I do have comments about the panel in the episode where I talked about 
about that panel that day of Baltimore Comic Con, and I will provide a link to that in the show notes. So that's it for episode 166. The next episode, I will be talking about the third and final day of the 2019 edition of Heroes Con. But for now, Hero- Heroes Con, no, not Heroes Con, Dave Talks Comics can be found at davetalkscomics.com, as well as on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. You can keep up with what I have been currently reading at davetalkscomics.net and what I've been watching at smallscreenscrawls.blogspot.com. I usually update those blogs on a daily or weekly basis, and I am running a little behind on that at this point. But links to Small Screen Scrolls can be found at davetalkscomics.com or davetalkscomics.net under the other blogs header on the right-hand side of the page. Remember now, davetalkscomics.com for the cast and .net for the notes. If you have comments or questions, I can be reached at davetalkscomics at gmail.com, on Twitter at davetalkscomics, or leave a comment on my website. I'm Dave. Thank you for listening. Three, 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 two, one.